My talk is on, I'm going to call it, the theology of the cross and walking with a limp. Uh, when, you know, uh, Catherine and I have worked on this book that's coming out this month, Every Good Endeavor, Connecting Your Work to God's Work. And uh, it was, a, for me in particular, it was a great deep dive into the theology of work. And what this meant <clears throat> to me was I, I came to realize that that though there's a great deal of uh, interest in, this, in the subject of integrating f faith with work, there are at least four different theological streams. Uh, and almost all movements or organizations or agencies or events that have to do with faith and work tend to reside in just one of the four. Uh, the four streams are these that I can identify. One I'll call the evangelical stream which is, it tends to have more to do with the heart. And the idea is that when it comes to faith and work, what we really need is Jesus in our heart to comfort us, to strengthen us, to help us uh, deal with our problems, to deal with, with to hold us down from getting uh, too big ahead in success, uh, to lift us up from being too uh, uh, deflated by failure. It has much more to do with the emotional, the psychological, the spiritual, uh, and uh, Jesus helped to deal with all the troubles and tri trials of being in work. Uh, the second stream would be, I call, the mainline Christian stream, and there the emphasis is on justice and on how to make sure your work deals with justice. And very often in that stream there's good critiques of capitalism, for example, and an and effort to, to think more uh, holistically about uh, how work is done and, and a lot of emphasis on the common good. A third uh, stream is what I'll call the Reformed Christian stream, which with all the emphasis on worldview. This comes out of Calvinism, and John Calvin actually. The idea that uh, there is no neutrality, everything is done from a point of view, Every, there is no view from nowhere. Everything that we do has to uh, represent a certain set of beliefs about uh, things, about human nature, about God, right and wrong, and so forth. And what's important is that we transform our work by working out of a Christian worldview. The fourth stream is the stream that you might call the Lutheran stream, Martin Luther. And I want to talk to you about that right now. Uh, I actually believe that all the streams have great, have biblical roots and warrant, and uh, I would certainly hope that the center faith of work continues to be what it is, and that is not necessarily completely uh, abiding in any one of those streams, but being more fully biblical than that. But I think sometimes uh, the Lutheran understanding of things isn't often seen, and that's actually the theme of this, of this conference, because of the idea of struggling and wrestling. Here's what Luther said <clears throat> in his Heidelberg Disputation, near the very beginning of his career as a Protestant when the, the, uh, the, uh, the church authorities were asking him, what are you really teaching? And he created what was called the Heidelberg Disputation. And in those days, what that meant was a series of theses. And theses 19, 20, and 21, I'm going to read you. Listen careful. That person does not deserve to be called a theologian who looks upon the invisible things of God as though they were clearly perceptible in those things which have actually happened. That's 19. 20. He deserves to be called a theologian, however, who comprehends the visible and manifest things of God seen through suffering and the cross. Number 21. A theologian of glory calls evil good and good evil. A theologian of the cross calls the thing what it actually is. Now here's what he's saying, and I'm going to try to apply it a little bit, and then go to a, the, the, the famous biblical text on wrestling with God in Genesis 32. But first... What Luther is saying is we must not make God, Christ over it, God over in our own image. We must uh, listen to him when he tells us who he really is. And he essentially, supremely, reveals himself to be himself through the cross. It's through suffering and through the cross. So, for example, when you hear the word power, what do you think that means? Right away, power means getting things done. And Luther says, if you take the normal human understanding of power, and when you hear the word power of God, you just go with that. You will sort of remake God in your own image. 
But if you want to understand what God's power looks like, look at the cross. You know, sin and death have won. God created a world that was perfect. He created a world in which there was no sin and there was no death and there was no decay. It was perfect. But sin and death have won. How is God going to defeat that? And he did defeat that. And where he's in the process of the, the, the triumph is not complete yet, but he has to, where did he defeat it? Where was the power of God strong enough, you might say, to defeat sin and death? The cross, weakness, suffering. Or when you hear the word wisdom, what do you think? Right away, what most people mean by wisdom, by the way, is knowing how to get things done. How do you really, how do you, results? You're wise, you know how to get things done, you know how to figure it out, you know, wisdom. Where does the Bible say God's wisdom is supremely seen? On the cross. On the cross. Now, wait a minute, though, you see. What you see Jesus doing on the cross is loving the unlovely, dying for people who are not lovely yet, who are not worthy of it, who don't merit it, and then substituting himself for them, going to people who are unlovely, who don't deserve to be loved in any way, and then putting himself where they should be. According to the wisdom of the world, that's nuts. You go with the movers, you move with the movers, you go for the people who can open doors for you. You don't go to the unlovely, you don't go to the weak, and then you climb up. You don't climb down. That's not how you're successful. You don't hang out with the weak and the marginal, and you don't climb down. And that's what Jesus did. And yet, by the way, if you're too busy climbing up the ladder to ever spend time getting down on the floor and playing with your kids, 30 years from now, you're going to wish you had done that. 30 years from now, you're going to wish you had climbed down and spent time with the weak instead of spending all those times in the boardroom because your life will be empty if you don't have your family anymore. Oh, well, maybe the logic of the cross isn't so stupid. No. You know, see, the way, you know, that's the reason why, why you know, Paul says, he, he says to the Greeks, you know, the cross is foolish, and to the Jews, the cross is weak. But to those who are being saved, both Greek and Jew, the cross is the true wisdom of God and the true power of God. Let me go a little step further. Let's think of work for a minute. If you don't take this Lutheran, which is really a biblical perspective, that you have to look at things through the cross uh, and through suffering in the cross and weakness of the cross, this is the, this is the way God reveals himself. If you don't do that, then you go into the world of work and there's a great danger. You could become a theologian of glory and a theologian of glory tends to say, well, only we Christians who understand the Bible and understand Christian worldview, we're the only ones that can do good work. We're the only ones that can do work the way it ought to be. But see, Luther says, wait a minute. God says he feeds every living thing. He makes us, he creates us, and he feeds every living thing. How does he feed every living thing, he says? He says, why, the simplest farm girl who's milking cows out there and who then sells it to the, 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 you know, the rough truck driver who takes it to the dairy and who takes it to... God is actually feeding you and giving you things to eat and drink through them. And therefore, just by doing their job, they are the masks of God. They are the hands and fingers of God. Just to do your work, whether you're a Christian or not, just to do your work well, you're doing God's work. The idea that only us ministers who are preaching the gospel or only us Christians who are applying you know, worldview, that's a, theologi that's a theology of glory. The theology of the cross says that everyone's doing God's work. Even the simplest, even the humblest, even the ditch digger is doing God's work. They don't need a worldview. God is using them to, to, to meet our needs. But lastly, and this is lastly on this, part, this first part, it's a nice long introduction, then we'll get to the text. Um, how do you think about suffering and wrestling and failure in general? Some years ago, well, there's more than once, I've, I've tried to explain to people that the cross is not just the way God atoned for your sin. Put it this way. 
The cross is not just an atonement, but a revelation of how God deals with us, the people he loves. What if the cross wasn't just a way that through Jesus Christ, God saved you? But what if the cross, and there's plenty of biblical evidence for this, is the way that God works through everybody he loves, not just Jesus? This gets a lot of people upset. Because a lot of people say, wait a minute, I don't mind Jesus suffering to save me, but now, hey, you know, uh, if God loves me and I'm his child and he's my father, he needs to take care of me, he can't let bad things happen to me. And this is what, uh, uh, it, it can't, and when bad things do happen, you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I thought that God loved me. I shouldn't be wrestling, I shouldn't be struggling, I shouldn't feel weak. What Luther would say, and I think this is, again, it's the, this is the biblical right thing to say, what Luther would say is, don't you see that the ultimate triumph of good over evil is that now when evil happens, God uses it for good. Not that it's gone. You see, the ultimate triumph is that evil can only, in the end, Romans 8, 28, God's working all things out, what? Romans 8, 28, all things work together. Not all things are good, but all things work together for good to those who love God. That's what the cross was, a horrible thing. Suffering for Jesus, bad things happen, and yet God worked through it for something incredibly good. Now, there's many crosses everywhere, and everything that happens in your life, if you give it to God, if you look to God, if you rest and trust in God, even the wrestlings, even the strugglings are ways in which God is changing you, growing you, blessing you. You know, um, remember Harold Kushner wrote, when bad things happen to good people? And he basically say, why does God let bad things happen to good people? And Luther would say, God lets bad things happen to good people because he's trying to bless them. Now, let's put us all together. Let me read you a text and just briefly show you its meaning and apply it to uh, rest, you know, faith and work. Uh, <clears throat> this is from Genesis 32. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till dawn. And when the man saw that he could not overpower Jacob, <clears throat> he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel and said, it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. And the sun rose above him as he passed Peniel and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Point one, what Jacob had been doing all of his life was wrestling with people. Here's the background to this thing. This is the climax of Jacob's life, basically. And the background is this. Jacob was a twin. He was the younger. He came out second. Even though he was a twin, he came out second. So the older one was Esau. And in those days, the older kid got everything, primogeniture. And yet, a prophecy had been given to Isaac that God was going to use Jacob to bring about the blessing, that Jacob should actually lead the family. Isaac just ignored it, and he loved Esau, and he doted on Esau, and he favored Esau. And you know how damaging that can be to the kid who's not favored, Jacob. And he grew up needy, you know, troubled, damaged. And at a certain point, <clears throat> if you know the story, um, Isaac decided to give Esau officially the head of the family estate, uh, which meant the blessing of the firstborn. And it was a kind of ceremony in which Esau was going to make uh, Isaac some food, and then Isaac was going to eat it, and he was going to bless him. Oh, Lord, I mean, oh, son, you know, oh, Lord, bless my son and let him be prosperous and so on. It's a formality. Because the idea of legally, I mean, Isaac was going to give Esau the legal headship of the family. But the blessing ceremony was a, was a formality. Jacob dressed up as Esau 
because Isaac was essentially blind, and came in and fixed him some food, and got Isaac to pronounce the blessing on Jacob. But of course, Esau found out about it, and Isaac found out about it, and Esau was ready to kill Jacob, so he had to leave home. And everybody sits around saying, what is, what's going on there? Why did Jacob, knowing that basically he couldn't get away with it, knowing that Isaac would find out that this was actually Jacob, and if Isaac wanted to give the, the legal headship of the family to, to, to Esau, he would. So why did Jacob do that? And here's the answer, the only good answer I know. Jacob must have been so, Jacob was willing to do anything so that even under false pretenses, he wanted to hear his father say, I love you. You mean more to me than everything. He wanted a blessing. We all need that. We all need someone from outside to come and say, you're great, you're wonderful, you're terrific. We desperately need that. It's not enough for us to tell ourselves we're great. If nobody else thinks we are, it doesn't work. We need people from outside. We need somebody from outside to come and bless us. And all of his life, and I don't have the time to go into the rest of it, basically Jacob was wrestling with Esau. Jacob was wrestling with Isaac. Then later on he goes running off to his uncle Laban to save himself from being killed by Esau. And he works for Laban, and he tries to get Laban's blessing. And Laban keeps tricking him. He says, I'll work for you, and I want to I marry Rachel, your daughter Rachel. And, and Laban says, sure, and then gives him Leah instead, and then he has to work for uh, Rachel, and some of you know how that story is. And finally, he leaves Laban. He runs away from Laban, and he's on his way back. And he hears that Esau is coming out with 400 men to meet him, and he's scared to death. He feels like Tamar is, the, is the, my, probably I'm going to die. And so he sends his... Uh, his he sends the rest of his family on ahead and he spends some time alone and suddenly some mysterious person jumps on him and starts wrestling with him. Who is this person? Here's what we know. Even though he's wrestling with this man all night, it says, when daybreak was about to come, the man saw he could not overpower him and he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so his hip was wrenched. And the word touch simply means he lightly touched Jacob's hip and immediately it was destroyed, shattered, never, ne never walked right again. Who is a person, who is this person that is so powerful? You see, he's been wrestling with Jacob, kind of like holding Jacob. It's almost like they're even. But suddenly, as daybreak comes, he shows that he's been holding it back. And he just reaches out and touches and shatters his leg. And then the second thing we were told is he says, I got to leave, Jacob, because it's almost daybreak. Nobody can see my face. And when Jacob says, what is your name? He says, you don't need to know my name. Who is this? It's God. And see, all, and, and the, as soon, here's the, the crazy thing. As soon as Jacob realizes it's God and realizes the sun is coming up, what should he have done? If he was rational, at least from what we could tell. He should be running away. He says, I don't, <laughs> the sun's coming up, seeing God? You die when you see God coming up. No, instead he holds on to him and he says, I will not let you go till, I, till you bless me, which is an amazing statement. Here's what he was saying when he did that. Basically, he was saying this. What an idiot I've been. Here is what I've been looking for all my life. Here's the approval I was looking for in my father's face. Here is the beauty I was looking for in Rachel's face. All my life, when I was dealing and dealing and wrestling with other people, I realized... I didn't realize that this is what I needed. I need you to bless me. Here is my blessing. Here is what I've been looking for all my life. I will not let you go till you bless me. And you are a permanent presence in my life. Nothing else matters. I don't care about the pain. I don't care that you just ruined my leg. I don't care that if the sun comes up, I would rather die than lose your blessing. You see what's happening? He suddenly realized in his work he'd been wrestling for blessing, in his sexual life he was wrestling for blessing, in his family life he was wrestling for blessing, and the reason why he's always been needy and always been a mess is because I really need God's blessing. This is the one that I need to bless me. And guess what? We're told, and I always get shivers when I see it, the text says, Jacob said, please tell me your name, but he replied, why do you ask my name? And then he blessed him there. The text does not tell us what he said, and blessings were always verbal. God must have said something to Jacob, must have said something to Jacob. I don't know what it was. 
But here's the point. Jacob would never, ever have realized what his problems are unless he'd been spending all this time wrestling. What if God had showed up 10 years before and said, you know, Jacob, you're trying to get your approval out of your family. It wouldn't have worked. What if he'd shown up with Joseph? If you know the story of Joseph, who was sold into slavery and went into prison. And... Joseph was an absolutely stuck-up kid, absolutely spoiled, ruined, you know, proud, evil, cynical. What if God had just showed up and said, you know, you're a spoiled brat? And would, would Joseph have said, oh, help me? No, spoiled brats don't do that. Nobody ever learns who they are by being told they have to be shown. Nobody's ever learned who you really are. You never learn who you are just by being told. You have to be shown. You have to wrestle. You have to experience weakness. And then finally you see where the blessing really should be coming from. That's what happened. Here's my points. End. You will never come to see who you are You'll never get any real knowledge. You'll never get any real strength. You'll never really get any character, any humility, any self-perspective, any wisdom, any depth, unless you've got trouble, unless you suffer, unless you wrestle, unless you experience weakness. See, God deals with it. He doesn't just atone for us, our sins with the cross. It's the way he helps us. Number two, one of our main problems is we fight God. And then even after we realize we've been fighting God, like Jacob, we still have to wrestle with God in prayer. We still have to get him in the center of our lives. That takes wrestling. That takes prayer. Very often you feel like your heart's dead, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to go back. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to repent. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to do it until I start to sense God's presence in my life. I will not let you go till you bless me. So prayer is a form of wrestling, and life is a form of wrestling. And you'll have a limp, and you'll rejoice. David Martin Lloyd-Jones is a wonderful, he, he was a doctor who became a pastor and a preacher, and Martin Lloyd-Jones has a wonderful uh, talk on this in which he says, all Christians who have true joy also limp. You dance, but you limp. You're broken before you can be made whole. And honestly, unless you go through this, you will be theologians of glory when it comes to your work. You'll be trying to get your blessing through your work. Bad. You'll be actually afraid of moving toward uh, difficulties in work. You'll avoid them. You'll avoid weak people. You won't, you won't care about the, the simple person. You'll hang out with the, with the, you know, uh, the powerful. You'll be remade in the image of the world. Don't do that. a theology of the cross, and walking with a limp.